I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Divya Bhatti. I'm going to let her tell you her title because she's AVP of a lot of things. Um, and she's going to get us started in, in this discussion. Weird mic, not mic. <laughs> uh, Doctor, yes, I'm Divya Bhatti, um, Associate Vice President for Institutional Effectiveness, Strategic Planning, Accreditation, and Assessment. So yes, a big title, a lot of portfolios, uh, but at heart, I'm a faculty. Started my roots by sitting where you are sitting. Uh, professor in the urban education department. So I don't forget my faculty roots ever. So when I sit here, I, I start thinking of where I was and where I have come so far. And all credit goes to all of us, like, you know, faculty colleagues and who helped me reach this milestone and these, this place. So with that note, uh, it's a good segue. Uh, we were in the, you know, Dr. Bordelon and uh, Mike and Kim Thomas were talking about strategic planning. It's a strategic plan basically is a, is a, shows us the path forward. So it's a good segue to look at accreditation and reaffirmation, which is a self-study to see where we have been. So on one hand, we talked about where we are going, what are the good things that we are doing, and reaffirmation is in my head and in, that's how it is is a self-study to see what we have done. How, what are the good things that we have done in class and out of class? So it's documentation of our past work with evidence that yay, we are doing work of quality. And it ties back into strategic plan. So we are moving from future and good projected things, the good things that we are doing into past with reaffirmation. We are class of 2026 for reaffirmation, meaning we are starting reaffirmation now. It's a, in, the, in a formal way, but it's an ongoing process. So before we start, I would love to get your thoughts. I joined the university on August 1. And it has been a whirlwind journey so far, but a wonderful one. And I'm sure you have heard me speak at various events, but it has been an engaging process. And I would love to get, take this time to get to know what are your thoughts about reaffirmation? I know many of you have been involved in the last reaffirmation or fifth year interim report. So at your table, I know you all are sitting at different tables. Let's, look, let's take a few minutes to think about how do we view reaffirmation? What's accredita what does accreditation mean for us as faculty? What do we, why do we have this process? What do we think it is? So time starts now. And then I would like to have a report out. Okay. <laughs> Are we ready to report on, I heard some good conversations going around as I was moving from table to table. Sorry, I couldn't reach all the tables. Um, but I would love to hear from you. And sincerely, what does accreditation mean for you? Who wants to go first? And I don't know, I don't think so. We have, do we have mics? Yeah, I'll go mic first. Show of hands or? I 
I think it's legitimacy, you know. Are, are we worth, are we who we say we are? Like we were saying, do we do what we say that we're doing? It keeps us accountable. Um, so legitimacy. Great, accountability, legitimacy, okay. Who else? I, I, I think it's two things when I think about it. Externally, it's uh, credibility and like, like what Peter said, internally it's pain, I think, uh, getting... Uh, pain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't what, hear that internally is? Uh, it's pain. Uh, it's I, a pain. Yeah, yeah. And, and I come from the College of Business where we just went through our reaccreditation, so uh, I think... Yes, college, college believe me, there. it's a pain, yes. I agree. <laughs> it's good to have the truth out there. <laughs> Absolutely, I own it. Uh, Here, this side. External validation and recognition of quality of what we do. Wonderful. External validation, which again goes to accountability related to it, and uh, absolutely stamp of quality. We have one more this side. Um, yes. It's uh, institutional thinking and institutional planning, because whatever we say we're going to do, we need to find a way to actually get it done and then report out on that. And that cannot happen without adequate support of all the parties that are involved in it. Very true, well, excellent point. It's about what, you know, what we say we do and we need that support and we make it happen. So it's a validation that yes, we are doing what we are supposed to be doing and we have the support, we have the resources to do so and here is the evidence of what we have, we have achieved so far. Yeah. Yeah. I just oh, I have enough time. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just saying I support what everybody has said, but also adding to um, making sure that we are following what we say we're going to do and supporting it with evidence-based data. Yes. So it's, again, with evidence, evidence, data. It's not what I say or you say. It's about evidence. Great conversation. And I'm sure. I think we, we touched on all these, but just we talked about quality, quality of education, also meeting professional standards. Yes, it's a pain, but if we meet it on an ongoing basis, that pain goes away or it subsides. Continuous improvement, as we were saying, we have what we are doing, how we are doing, how do we prove so with evidence. And of course, meeting our academy ex expectations. I heard some of, that, some of that this side. As well as transferability of our credits and federal aid, these two points. That's, a, that's the reason it's required. It's mandated by the feds. SAC COC is our national accreditation agency, but there are other agencies across the entire country. Western side, WISAC, you know, we have Northwest. All these accreditation agencies are recognized by federal, federal government and they have federal aid consequences attached. So just to keep that in mind. All right, what are the expectations when we go through an accreditation process? And some of the nuggets are here. These are some examples. Uh, it de demonstrates how well we are fulfilling our mission. M our mission sets the institution to, you know, which direction it should be going. Again, it's a, it is a framework for strategic planning as well. It's also commitment, our commitment to student success. What are the good things as faculty we are doing in our classroom and outside to move the needle for our, our students? It's and providing that evidence. It's also our commitment, it shows our commitment to quality enhancement. Accreditation encompasses all these aspects. 
it's also as well as we all talked about it, documentation of quality education. In, I, I was asked a question in one of the tables, why do we have to press an emergency button whenever accreditation is nearby? Why, we are, why, is, you know, why are we not like others? It all goes back to the question, how do we make this process sustainable? Institutions have moved away from pressing that emergency button to say, how do we incorporate these standards or expectations into our on, in, in ongoing basis into our processes and make it seamless? Yes, that is possible. Because all the standards that SAC COC includes in reaffirmation are part of the work that we all do on ongoing basis. Nothing new, nothing different. And you will see that in a couple of slides. So let's start a journey from the past. Show of hands, how many of you were involved in the last reaffirmation? Has it been 10 years now? I see this side. Couple of hands here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten people in the room. My bow to you. My highest respect to you for your contributions in the last reaffirmation process. Imagine it has been ten years now. Because last reaffirmation report was submitted in 2015 and we were class of 2016. Similarly, our report will be submitted in 2025, and we, were class, we are class of 2026. The reason we call it a class of 2026 is because we will be hosting SACS UC on-site team here in 2026. So, now we're going into how we do, how should we do this process this time around? Of course, those who are involved, your contribution is vital because you were there last time. And we, I value and we value your feedback, your, the lessons that you could remember that could help us in this journey for getting the institution reaffirmed. So what has changed from last time? I've been asked this question several times. Last 10 years, SAC COC revamped the standards. That's the biggest thing. They, re, they revamped, reorganized, changed, added new standards, and revamped the entire principles of standards document. So on the left-hand side, I won't read all those standards, but instead of calling them standards, they club them under different themes. I call them sections. They call them sections, I call them themes. So for example, the section one is principle of integrity, which runs across all other sections. Data integrity, other in other work that we do, we do it with integrity. And other sections are there. So the biggest change that has happened since last reaffirmation is the revamping of standards and adding on new standards. So the rigor and the expectation has gone up, which is natural because the world has shifted. 10 years is a long time. So how, what is included in the reaffirmation structure? As you all know, and you've heard me before, but I'll just repeat for those who have not heard it again, we will be submitting two reports. Compliance report, which is called compliance certification report, and a quality enhancement document. Quality enhancement plan basically is a student success project. It's a faculty-driven project, and it's for our students. There is a lot of involvement of students as well as staff. So it's not just faculty, but it's faculty-driven. At UHD, we, and it's an, accreditation is an iterative process. Compliance certification document for us, for the, for the university, for UHD, will be submitted on September 8th, September 8th, 2025. It's the due date for submitting, the DD date. We cannot move it. We have to backtrack from that date to prepare the document. And then we get another chance 
If SAC COC, after they do an on-site, off-site review, after we submit the document in, on September, and then they do an off-site review and they have some questions regarding different sections or standards, we get a chance to answer those questions. That chance to answer those questions is called focus report. And that's the reason it's written if needed. That would be submitted in somewhere in January of 2026, along with the quality enhancement plan. Then we host the on-site, which for us, you can mark your calendar if you're really you know, planning forward. That's, those are the dates out there. Uh, it's March 2 through 5, 2026. It seems far away, but it's not. Time flies, as you can see, we've come We've taken that journey from last reaffirmation to this reaffirmation. And then, if by chance the on site has questions, after they come here, they talk to you all, they review things, they still have questions, then we get another chance, another opportunity to clarify our stand and provide additional evidence. And that opportunity is called response report. So we get a lot of chances as you can see. And we submit that response report, and then it's reviewed by the compliance report is reviewed. If we have a focus report, that's reviewed, and the response report is reviewed by the Board of Trustees. And basically, the Board of Trustees consists of experienced professionals, presidents, chancellors of different universities. So it's a totally a peer review process. Now, this is a document that SAC COC shares and those who attended. How many of you attended the SAC COC annual meeting last December? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we had a huge content. I think we were almost like 16 people there. So they share this document about most frequently cited standards. They take a sample of universities that have gone through a reaffirmation process. And this sample is 76. So they looked at 76 institutions who were a class of 2022. And then they put together this table. As you can see, the most important standards out there, most important standards. I'm not saying the others are less important, but these are the ones that are frequently cited. Faculty qualifications. Are the qualifications matching the courses that we are teaching? Simple. You think that's a simple thing? Now, most institutions get cited. As, you, as I talked earlier, we get a lot of chances. You can see the percentage is moving from 95% in the, at the off-site level, when the off-site committee reviews it. It goes down because institutions sum, submit focus report, additional evidence, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so they get another chance to get that reviewed, and it goes down to 18% with the, with the on-site. And then they get another chance response report, but still, till the very end, it's zero percent at the board level. So it comes down. Program faculty faculty teaching by program. It's a, it's a new standard, 6-2-B. 54% of the institutions got cited in the, in the off-site. Drilled down to 6%. At the board level, final evaluation of the institutional sufficiency, adequacy of faculty by program, 4%. There were institutions, 4% out of 76 institutions. Do the math. Same, similarly for faculty appointment and evaluation. Think, we are very important. I say we as faculty, we are very important. Our, the work that we do really counts. 51%, half of 76 institutions had this standard cited. And then it went up, it wasn't, I mean, 3% of the institutions were still having, had issues at the board level. Student achievement, student success, 
it's a parent standard for assessment. That was 41% at the off-site level. Student outcomes, assessment, program assessment that we do through the Office of Assessment, program assessment, was cited. 47% of the institutions got questions at the off-site level. It went down to 22%. Finally, board at the board of trustees level, SAC CSC, 9%. What does that mean? Meaning 9% of the institutions were, really, were not able to meet the expectations of SAC CSC regarding assessment, even after multiple opportunities. So they were put on monitoring. That's called monitoring, and we'll see in a, a second. So common reasons for non-compliance. One of the things, as a SAC COC reviewer myself, I have reviewed several institutions. Most important issues at the off-site level are insufficient evidence. We are not able to provide documentation, or we are not providing the correct documentation, or we are not including evidence of what we are saying we are supposed to be doing. So evidence doesn't exist because you finally realize, oh, I don't have this. And that's where the panic button comes. Evidence doesn't you know, relate to what we are saying. It's recently implemented. So whatever evidence we give, it has to be mature because that's the evidence of continuous quality improvement. So if we implement something, let's say, in 2025, just as an example, and we are submitting a compliance report in September of 2025, and that evidence is made, let's say, it's an uh, example of a, a procedure that we are implementing. It's not mature enough because it's just implemented. SAC COC reviewers don't have evidence, sufficient evidence to say that it would work. So they can't say yay and nay for compliance. Couldn't find the evidence. You know, the, the compliance report is a huge document. One over, sometimes over 1,000 pages. And the institutions, I've seen it in my experience, institutions make it hard for the reviewers not to find the evidence. You go to this page, click this, click that, click that, click that, click that, so can't find it. Ultimately, the reviewers give up and say, forget it. Let them have a re focused report. And I'm saying this by experience. So that's what it is. Poor narrative. Somebody who is not a subject matter expert has written that narrative. And the folks who should be involved and who, whose work that is have not been involved. So poor, re poorly written narrative and not providing evidence for the fall of the requirement of a policy is a big one. So there are th three things that SAC COC requires for if we have a policy. Biggest is that policy is written and there is a, a, a review cycle on it. It's communicated to the stakeholders, students, faculty, staff. And it's implemented, evidence of implementation. So if we revise a policy, how do we communicate it to the, stu to the students? How do we communicate to the faculty? How do we communicate to the staff? What is the evidence? Not because, hey, I, we communicated. No, where is the evidence to prove so? How, what modes it was, it was communicated? Where is um, the evidence of implementation? How was that policy implemented? Think of those things. And that's the reason I know Judith was covering about workload policy in the strategic planning. It's an important policy. But we, use, we need to have these two other steps, communication and implementation, to be in compliance. And we have other policies that have, that have to have a review cycle, an ongoing review cycle, because things change. Processes change, people change. We need to keep updating those. So there has to be a review cycle on the policies. 
So this is an example of one of the issues that SACS COC says that we as a reviewers from SACS COC have come across. This is what I was talking about. The biggest, the greatest, the, the most best outcome for UHD should be the first one after we go through reaffirmation. We have reaffirmation, no question asked. No reports, nothing further. Compliance certification, here you go. Great, you are, you know, we don't have any questions on it from the offsite. Great job. We don't have any questions when we host the onsite. Good work, and we are reaffirmed. We get, yay, that's the best outcome. But there are other possible outcomes we can have. For example, the first one, I won't go through the others. This slide would be posted, but the most scary one is the last one. Many institutions, if you look around, even our, I won't say it publicly because I'm being recorded here. <laughs> but our sister institutions, if you go on their website, within the system, are on monitoring. They have the second, the first outcome in this one. The first one. UHD, like for example, hypothetical example, UHD submits, we get a focus report, we submit again, and we did a focus report, we host the on-site, we get a response report, we still have questions, the board, it goes through the Board, board of Trustees review from SAC COC. We still get questions. We are on monitoring for two years. After monitoring, again, we submit a report. Then it's an iffy thing. Then we go to the second stage, the second tier. And then we get into probation. And then we again has a chance, have a chance. The reds, we get into the reds. And then finally, it's the loss of accreditation. And those of you who attended SAC COC conference can attest, and you can talk to them. SAC COC publicly throws it out on the slides that you are reaffirmed. Here are the institutions who have gone through uh, probation or are on probation. Here are the institutions who are, who are going through monitoring. So everybody, everyone comes to know about it. So it's, it's like your reputation. So how are we doing this reaffirmation? As my goal is always to make it sustainable, so we are not pressing this button. One of the ways to make it sustainable is to divide our standards that SAC COC has into working groups and involve those individuals who have clear alignment or experience with the work that should be going on in, within the institution. So we constituted leadership team, which, which SAC COC basically recommends, saying in the leadership team for the reaffirmation, here are the individuals who should be there. So for UHD, the leadership team consists of the president, the provost, CFO, Kim Thomas, Lisa Joyner, um, faculty senate president, Dr. Bernardo is there currently, but whoever takes on in the future would be that, would be part of the leadership team. Uh, staff, council president, and student government association president, and a staff representative, staff uh, wh who assist with the process. So Emily Leffler is there. Then we have a steering committee, and some of you, how many of you are in the steering committee and you got letter from Dr. Bodleon, Provost Bodleon? Show of hands. Steering committee, reaffirmation steering committee, one. Show of hands. I see some, two, three, four, Yes, so they are deans, they are faculty, they are staff, they are VPs, and I am chairing the reaffirmation steering committee. We will have a lot of meetings, and these are open meetings. Most welcome to come in if your schedule permits, and we'll, we'll talk in a second about it. We also have a quality enhancement plan committee, steering committee. Are there any members sitting from the quality enhancement plan? Show of hands. So, and then there will be, for quality enhanced, we have three, four here. Uh, there will be subcommittees that would develop the chosen topic. And I can talk in detail about how this process will work, but I just want to make sure Judith has given me only 20 minutes, 25. 
10 minutes left. So, um, And then we'll have 18 compliance certification working groups, which will be chaired by a member of the steering committee. So for example, Provost Bordelon is chairing five of those working groups, or two or three are chaired by some other folks who are in the steering committee. I'm chairing two groups. I'm also chairing the steering committee. So that way, and these, and I encourage you to be participant in, the, in these working groups to provide your expertise and your, your knowledge. Because this is, again, I want to link the two. This is the most important process. It's a mammoth process for our institution. But it's a process which aligns with our 50th anniversary because it's a documentation of quality work. It aligns with our strategic plan because it's giving us path forward. It's a crucial, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, another stamp of quality and it's, a, it's, a, it's coming at the time when we are going through a 50 year celebration. It's again, celebration of the good work that we are doing with evidence. So I've been asked this question, what role do you play? Well, we all play a role in this. You know, the self-study, as I have been saying numerous times, is a documentation of the good work that we as a faculty are doing in the classroom and outside the classroom. So it's, it, it examines how well the mission is aligned to everything that we do as we talked about at, the disc, at, at our tables. And you will get a lot of opportunities to participate. Here are some ways that you can participate in, and I encourage you to do so. Like Doc De Deborah McGoy was saying, we need your help. This is our process. I would like you to participate in this process. And here are some opportunities. We have compliance certification working groups. Do volunteer. Attend the meetings. Give your suggestions. They are open meetings and will be advertised and will be communicated. We are working with University Relations, Dr. Deborah McGoy's uh, office, to make sure that the communication goes out to the campus about these meetings and repeated reminders. We have QEP subcommittees that would be developing the topic that would be chosen. And calls will go out soon. We have the quality enhancement call going out from the QEP co-chairs, Tim Reddell and Stephanie Records, uh, on January 12th. There'll be a one month process and the last date for submission of proposal for the topic would be February 12th. Participate in the SAC COC on-site team. They will be here, eight to 10 people, eight, not eight to 10, like seven to eight, sorry. Uh, and they will come and talk to you. Participate in that process. Attend QEP and reaffirmation committees because these committees, they are steering committee meetings and working group meetings, but you're most welcome to attend if your schedule permits to give your input. And if you're not able to attend them, send it to us. Happy to incorporate that input because it's what we are doing is for all of us together. Why are faculty critical to the process of reaffirmation? What do you think is the answer? Well, remember, we work with students. Because of our training, because of our, you know, our experience, is critical to standards related to faculty. For example, I put curriculum related standards. As you saw on that most cited standard list, there are so many faculty related standards. You need to be involved. You need to provide guidance. You need to be part of the conversation. And also, there are, and there's, there's a list here. I won't go over the list. Happy to share this presentation, but some of these standards are crucial, vital standards, curriculum related standards, faculty credential standards, adequacy of faculty, assessment standards, academic program director standards, uh, academic governance standards, shared governance standards, et cetera, et cetera. These are all standards related to all the work that we do as faculty. Also, we faculty, 
by, by training are analytical, research-oriented. This is a process that talks about research, evidence-based process. So you're, that's exactly what we require. So please do you know, participate and volunteer your time because this is an important process for you all. You should be the voice of it. You should play, you should give con your, your input here. This is just broad timeline, broad strokes. December, so our initial review from June, January to May 24th, 2024, is we, are, we, we, are, we have a kickoff steering committee meeting on January 26th. We are constituting working groups. One thing which I want to say, the positive, which I forgot to mention earlier, SACS UC started a differentiated review process. What that means is that SACS UC has 70 plus standards, 70 standards, let's say that way, about, about 70 standards. They decided that institutions who meet certain criteria can, in their compliance report, in the decennial review process, can be answerable to only a subset of it. So when I joined, we applied for this differentiated review process. And we were approved to have a differentiated review process, which is really a good you know, uh, outcome. Now what that means is we will have 40 standards out of the 70 to answer. It's not that, as Dean Usman was saying one day, that the 30 others are not important. They are important, they're less important, no. So when the on-site is here, they might ask you questions about the other 30 ones too. So we answer in the compliance report 40, but we need to make sure that we are have in our heads the expectations of the other 30 as well, just in the broad. I'm not saying you have to have 30 other in, in your head. So from January through May, we are doing, we are constituting working groups, and the initial drafts of the compliance narratives are due on May 1. May 1st, 2024, so not far away. Then comes summer, that summer work continues on. And then we have, in December 2024, the leadership review of the draft standards. And then in June, we are hosting an advisory visit from SAC COC VP who is assigned to us. Every institution is assigned a VP and then we submit compliance report on September 2. My goal is September 2 instead of September 8. eight. September 8 is the due due date. I don't want to wait till September 8. Goal is to submit on September 2. And then we host, we submit QEP, and any focus report, if any, I'm saying we won't have to do that. I'm pretty confident, positive, glass half full. And we submit in January of 2026. And then March through two through five, we host the on-site. And in December 2026, we hear we are reaffirmed. So this is just a broad timeline. Here is the timeline for QEP. We have started the process of QEP. The steering committee met in on December 20 last year, 2023. Calls for proposal go out next, I mean this week, this Friday. You know, the QEP steering committee is going to review the proposals. We have a QEP rubric that SAC COC gives. They'll be using, the steering committee would be using that rubric to assess the proposals. So I encourage you to apply, to give, you know, submit proposals for student success projects. Um, so we'll continue the work on, as you can see, April through November 2024. We'll constitute subcommittees to develop the proposal further and make it into a 100-page document. Then April through May 2025, we're gonna look at visibility of the project, what kind of resources, work through budget, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that we have zero-year implementation things in place for the, for the project. And then we submit in January. These are just broad stroke. There are detailed timelines also available. All right. Any questions? I'm happy to entertain questions.
I'm happy to entertain any questions here. I, there's one. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, so are we starting from scratch when we build this report or can we build on our previous report? Good question. So we are, uh, my, intent, my intent, my suggestion, my recommendation is we don't start from scratch. So we, when we, we will build a, te a team structure in the, in the teams, a structure, folder structure, because we don't want, I don't want any emails with all flying around on campus. So we will start We'll have examples of what we had submitted related to those narrative, related to those standards that you can look at it and start from there. So we are not starting from scratch. At the same time, we have submitted narratives for fifth year interim report. If that's applicable, if they are still applicable, you can use those too. But keep in mind, from last reaffirmation to this reaffirmation, standards have changed. So if, you're, if we start from the narrative that was submitted last time, it's great, we start from there and we start updating, but we, the expectations and the language and the standard has changed. Keep that in mind. And then some standards might be new. For example, program faculty standard was not there in the last reaffirmation. It's new, so you won't find a, 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 an example of that. Go ahead, sorry. Last question. Um, Judith is saying I'll, I'll last try, question. I'll try to be brief. I'm the um, assessment coordinator for the chemistry program. And in the past, we have gotten a lot of support, especially when we had to submit um, you know, demographic information inside our reports from um, Dr. Campbell's office. What kind of support can we expect in the future from your office to um, be able to deliver the same kind of reports that we have in the past? Short answer is we'll give you every support that you require. Okay, because you. we have search going on, we'll have an executive director for assessment and accreditation that searches on, and we'll have a director for assessment and accreditation, and we have an assistant director for competency-based education search on. So there are three positions that we need to fulfill. Full, sorry, not fulfill, fill. My head is not at the right place right now. Yes, so fill, and in addition to that, you will have every support you require, and I promise you that. Give Dr. Body a hand. Um, I don't actually think you have a round table, so I think during lunch, if people have questions, you'll maybe be around, yeah. Yeah. And there's also gonna be a, a website, a SAC COC website, right? Yes. So yeah. Okay, no, but the video can't. The recording can't. Yes, I forgot to mention, we will have a SAC COC reaccreditation or accreditation website, which will have everything that we have been doing, meeting minutes, membership, working groups, schedule, things that we have been doing. The only thing that we want to host it on the public site is the standards that we, we would be working on. They will be in the Teams folder and a structure. We'll have examples from other institutions. We'll have examples of our past reports. We will have, and also I will personally have a consultation with each group, working group, to make sure the expectations and hold and, pro and provide that guidance and ongoing feedback. We'll also have internal readers to read through the narratives, and we'll hire an external consultant to give us an external point of view. So those are the things that will be there. Thank you. OK, so our last presentation, um, so we'll, we'll do this presentation, we'll have lunch, and then we'll have round tables. Um, ORSP will actually have a table during roundtables, so they're going to present for about half an hour. We're going to have lunch, and then we'll move to the roundtables. Um, so just to kind of provide some background, I think most of you know that ORSP has been through a transformation. It's been largely understaffed for several years. Um, 
And so in the fall, we've started to try to make sure that we've got the positions filled, um, division of duties, that sort of thing. We started the um, ORSP Faculty Fellows Program. So we're trying to do some really cool things um, to support faculty. I asked um, Denise Virgin, who is the new director of pre-award services, and Shannon Teasley Bick Nichols, who is the director of post-award services, just to come and talk to us about their vision for ORSP, and, um, and then also to talk a little bit about the uh, ORSP Faculty Fellows Program. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to get started in one second. Good morning, my name is Denise Bergen. I am the new director for pre-award services. As Dr. Quander had stated previously, um, the office has gone through transformation and there are a separation between pre and post. Um, we are really excited about everything that's coming up within the new year and going forward. Extremely excited about working with faculty and um, we're gonna start off with introducing ourselves. My name again, Denise Bergen. I have been in research administration for about 20 years. I've been with UHD for about five, almost six years now. Um, I came over from the College of Public Service. Um, I'd like to introduce my counterpart. And if the research fellows are here, I believe they are in, I see Dr. Chan. Um, I don't see Dr. Johnson. Are you in? There he is. Perfect. Come closer. Okay. I always feel like I'm really loud already. So um, I would like to introduce my counterpart here. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Shannon Teasley McNichols. I was formerly the interim executive director for the department. I'm really grateful that we have staff now and that we have um, an expanding team. It's been great to have Denise on board as well as our other staff members that have been growing. And again, we do have um, split responsibilities inside of the office. I'm the director of post award services, as well as responsible for research compliance and overall grant management for the department. So I'm managing over $26 million of external funding for the university. And Denise has the luxury of bringing in all of that additional funding for us. So we're excited to share um, where we are and where we plan on going. Thank you. So as a new component, um, we added faculty fellows, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about who the fellows are, but I first want to introduce them. Dr. Chan and Dr. Johnson, if you would please come forward, introduce yourself. Sure. We're really excited well, about them joining us. If you want, you can go to the mic, or you can come up on the stage. Sure. All right. Um, so my name is uh, Yongxia Chen. Yeah, I'm uh, in the mathematic uh, statistics department, and yeah, I just get promoted to the professor. So that. that <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, uh, Dr. Johnson and I get selected for this uh, serving for this spring semester and a little bit of summertime. Yeah, and our role here just to help you guys. Uh, we may luckily to get some, yeah, some uh, successful grant. So then, if you if you like, say you say, hey, you have successful grant. Can I have that proposal from you? Yeah, feel freely to to ask. So we just give it to you. Seems like this nature. Okay, go ahead. And uh, I'm Kenneth Johnson, um, associate professor in geosciences. Um, Feel free to stop by my office. It's uh, North 808. <clears throat> and feel free to email me or, or phone me. Um, I'm at your disposal. Um, I'm here to help with uh, any input that I can 
regarding the proposal writing process, uh, particularly for untenured faculty uh, who may sort of have a, a difficulty getting started, um, please come see me. Happy to help. Thank you. And fellows will also join us at our round table so we can kind of have an opportunity to talk to them a little bit more in depth and learn a little bit more about their experiences. Um, I'll also discuss a little bit further about their role in our office and working with the faculties going forward. So uh, if you're not familiar with what the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs entails, I'm sure a lot of you are already researchers, but you may not have encountered our office depending on what level of research you've been doing thus far. So our essential goal overall, our mission of course, is to increase our research portfolio and also to encourage faculty and staff to provide enriching research opportunities for our students it also brings notoriety to our university. Um, we are a growing institution and over the years, our portfolio has increased tremendously. Um, this is a part of the reason why our office has been expanding at this point. Um, what we, uh, we hope to do is to encourage faculty to come to us, to speak to us. We're also going to reach out to you as well. We want you to feel comfortable and confident that you're able to get the service that you would like to be this greater entity in itself as, as a researcher, as a professor, as someone that wants to provide opportunities to your students and also to provide other um, opportunities for the university as a whole. As we grow and we have opportunities that come through various agencies, these opportunities are great and if we can take advantage of them as they come along, by all means, definitely take advantage of the opportunities that we have within our offices. So, Shannon, would you like to talk about our guidelines? Sure. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. I'm getting over a little sinusitis from um, traveling for the holiday. Um, I'm just gonna briefly go over the guidelines. Everyone knows where they can find them on our Office of Research and Sponsored Programs website. Um, basically, we wanna be able to lay out all of the processes for our office, as well as you being a partner in the work that we do in sponsored programs. So you can find that online. Um, we actually are going to revamp our website. We're working closely with Academic Affairs. Um, Addie, Adeline, she's wonderful. We're setting up appointments with her so that we can have all the updated information for you. Some of the things that we've heard over the past couple of months is, um, access to responsibilities and roles. What is it that the Office of Research actually does? And then what is our counterparts, our partnership with you as a, a principal investigator? What do you do? As well as your office um, support staff, your department business administrators, your directors, your administrative assistants. We actually consider everyone that I just mentioned a team. It takes all of us to be able to strategize um, building additional infrastructure, financial infrastructure for the institution, as well as managing those grant funds after we receive them. So the guidelines are clearly posted on our um, website. And if you have any questions about them, you can also feel free to reach out to us and we will be updating that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, great. This helps to clarify what we actually do. So there's a three pronged um, initiative in our office and we are we have pre-award services which is where we apply for the funding and you work really hard with your team as, as well as the expanded team that we have now with the research fellows so we're really excited about that so that's the proposal driven portion of our office that's where you strategize your projects in advance work with your departments work with your colleges and then once you have your preliminary drafted um, proposal you work with Ms. Denise Bergen here. And she's very familiar with all the funders um, that we have, has great relationships as she's mentioned. She's worked in uh, research administration for some years. And then we have the post-award um, services, which is my wheelhouse of the office, as well as Denise Ingram. She's our assistant director of post-award services. And we have a job um, of managing all the funds after they've come in from A to Z. That means negotiating your contracts and your um, agreements, 
That includes outreach to the University of Houston system system. We have counterparts over there that um, are a resource to us in our office, and we negotiate the indirect cost rates as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit um, later on. Uh, so briefly, these are the three prong areas of our office. Compliance, that's another uh, wheelhouse in my area. That was my ori original job uh, description that I had when I first came to the university a year ago. I was assistant director of research compliance and grant administration, and I still hold that, um, that those work tasks within my job description. So I basically, um, you hear from me a lot in regards to compliance, making sure that you have your conflict of interest, uh, financial conflict of interest form updated. And you'll, we'll be reaching out to you again, uh, probably in the middle of January, for those who have not updated theirs this year. Um, we're also responsible for human subjects. I work with Dr. Kit Cho and Dr. Theravathu. Uh, they are the chair and co-chairs co of our human subjects IRB committee. Um, I also uh, liaise with the biosafety committee. And we basically make sure that we stay on task and strategize uh, ways to eliminate challenges with all of our funders. We want to make sure that we're in compliance for every award that we have, and that includes um, submitting <coughs> reports, working with you to gather financial information, to provide updated pro appropriate proposal narratives so that we are in compliance with each of the agencies. So we thank you for your patience as we've been trying to roll out new processes and procedures for that so that everybody can submit their reports timely. So as we um, introduced earlier, the faculty fellows, this is a new component that we wanted to add to our office. Dr. Fonder and Dr. Borlon really had this excellent idea about having a faculty mentor that is someone that is more experienced in grantsmanship, and those are Dr. Chen and Dr. Um, Johnson, pardon me. Um, what we plan on doing within the spring is have workshops to kind of discuss the process of putting together a proposal. Basically the soup to nuts. What do you even do to start off being a PI? What does that mean? How does this affect your tenure? How does it affect your research? So we're working with these faculty members and others as well within the institution that have had the experience. With that, this is someone that is a peer to you where you can kind of discuss exactly what you're going through. They've been there and they understand the process and they know exactly what it takes to have a successful proposal. Um, I'll be working closely with them as a big part of my responsibility is ensuring that your proposals are the best proposals going out of the door so that we are always funded. In my mind, every time a proposal leaves our office, it's being funded. So I speak it into positivity as a professor comes in and tells me they are, what they're planning on doing. I even I have the option of, um, if you're interested in even discussing um, opportunities or any future projects that you're interested in and you're just not sure about how, to even start the process. Um, that is another big component of something that we can do to help you to make sure that you're successful in your endeavors. So what exactly is a sponsored program? What's a sponsored program, Shannon? <laughs> what does that even mean? So essentially it is a project that you are going to be working on that has specific spe specific designated deliverables so this is your project this is what you're planning on doing you are proposing to an agency a, a project something that's going to help your your institution something that's going to help your department something that is going to help your program this particular project has a set guideline from the agency that tells you all of the things that they're requiring for you in order to receive this particular funding. And there are various mechanisms that are considered as sponsored programs, and that includes um, grants, cooperative agreements, contracts, and we're breezing through, I'm so sorry, because we're, we're short on time. Mm -hmm. And um, we will provide this so that you can have a little bit more detail to just kind of look over what each individual mechanism is. But who can serve as a PI? So everyone essentially in this room as a faculty member can serve as a principal investigator. What does that even mean? You are the lead on your project, essentially. 
Um, and when you're going in to submit, you're going to discuss all of your research goals. You're going to put together the proposal. So you almost think about it as if you're applying to a job. So an agency is going to say, we want to fund A. So you're looking at this and saying, wow, this is exactly what I do. I can actually re receive support to do my work. You can also write in, in your proposal to support your students. You can support your department. So a lot of various things that you can include into your proposal you definitely want to do. You, you must hold a full-time appointment at UHD and other in entities, under individuals at the institution that can serve as PIs are um, a director or higher, but the lecturers and I believe instructors too can only serve as a co-PI. And what that means is that's your counterpart on the grant. You would be the lead as the PI, the co-I is someone that is your partner. And it doesn't necessarily have to even be a partner here at UHD. You can partner with individuals at other institutions nationwide, not just in the city of Houston. So exactly what is the process to even start this? So whether or not you have identified a funding opportunity, um, if you have one already, perfect. If you don't, give me a call. I can help you locate something that will fit perfectly for your grant and we can write to it so that every single end of, every single piece of that proposal is addressed so that you are the top candidate for receiving this particular funding. So we had a very um, narrow timeline in the past where it was literally 10 days before. We're hoping to increase that so that it gives us more time to work with you as a faculty member to specifically go through your proposal to make sure that we've covered all of the bases as far as the guidelines are concerned. So where it says it was 10 days in, in the past, there isn't, I we would prefer to have the 30 days for the notice of intent. And what the notice of intent is essentially is letting your department and your chair know and our office know that you plan on submitting a report. And this is after you've actually received something that you want to apply to. Again, if you have no idea where you want to apply, if you don't know what agency you're looking for, that doesn't have a timeline at all. You can schedule an appointment to meet with me at any time and we can discuss your goals. Um, and after that point, we can start working together on the proposal. Research proposals take a little bit more time because they're a little more intensive. So at that point, we kind of want to add a little bit more time to work with that versus rather than having 15 days, 30 days will be a better opportunity. Um, and then the final draft for review, the preference is 10 days. And this is specifically why we want to increase this is because, again, you may miss something. There may be documentation that you need to have to include in your proposal. You may have to get permissions from your department or your chair. So you want to have the opportunity to not be rushed when you're doing your proposal because at that point you're putting out your best product. And then the finalization of the project budget. Most PIs wait until the last minute to work on the budget and it gives them the most stress. Um, it's okay. Um, the budget can be a little tricky and this is absolutely something that we do in our department, in our office to make sure that you feel confident in what you're putting out to the agencies. The final proposal transmittal form, and what that means is uh, this is your final, final, yes, I'm about to submit this. This is what my draft looks like. This is what my budget looks like. And your chair and your dean will see, okay, yes, I'm happy, I'm excited. This person is going to be submitting something. However, if there's any individual, if there's per pertinent information that they need to know, such as um, any cost share that they may not be familiar with, or if you're requesting course release. If you haven't done that, it still gives you some time to be sure that you're able to get all of that information. And then where we would submit the day of and the day before, we would prefer to have three days. And why that is, is at any point, anything can happen. Systems go down, you may have a last minute change that um, may occur, maybe a PI decides that they don't have the time or you decide maybe this is not the best option. 
So it gives you a couple more days to say, okay, I've got some corrections and we can go forward with it. And even sometimes the agency will come back and say, can you add this or can you correct that? So it'd be, if you have the extra time, why not take advantage of it? So after receiving your funds, after you see my lovely face, I'll come give you a hug and say congratulations, and I'll hand you over to my lovely counterpart in my office because they will take great care of you on that point. And Shannon, if you would, please. Sure. Thank you. Yes, that's the exciting part, receiving that award notification from the funder saying congratulations. That's the first step, right? You, you share that with your college and your department chair, and more than likely you'll receive an email from me followed up copying the provost and sometimes the president's, um, depending on the level of the grant, about the award. So then we set up, what do you do next, right? You meet with our office and we will review the award document with you because sometimes depending on the funder, there's a lot of different steps that we have to move through in the process. Some of them is filling out additional paperwork, um, submitting an updated um, resume, your CV or information of that matter. Sometimes the president has to sign off on the documentation as well, depending on the amount of the grant. And in some cases, um, we meet with the provost to review the the capacity of the grant, sometimes it's three to five years, and we need to make sure that we have leveraged enough staff to support you. There's additional hirings that's required for those, um, those major projects. And so that's where we take over and we work with you and your department to move through that. We'll be having some workshops later. I won't deep dive into that, but when we have the round tables, we can go into that more um, specifically. But basically, when the award comes in, the very next thing is to be able for you to have access to the funding is our office will move forward with a request to set up a cost center. So once we receive your grant number, we share that with your department and we hold a kickoff meeting with you where we go through the entire grant award notification. We go through your responsibilities as the PI, our responsibilities at the university overall, and then what the funder expects from us throughout the life cycle of the grant. We review all of that during the kickoff. And during that time, it's not only a time just to be excited, because we've seen this in the past. You come to the meeting, yes, when can I spend my money? I'm ready for my DBA to move forward with ordering my supplies, et cetera. We want you to pay attention specifically in the kickoff now. This is your time to ask questions and drill down to all the things that you did not have answers to when you were moving through the pertinent piece that Denise Bergen mentioned earlier in your budget um, narrative and your budget justification and building your actual budget. So sometimes we hypothetically say things, right? We want to be able to do these things with this chunk of money. But this is your opportunity during the kickoff to really flesh out and discuss that with our office because we'll work with you to go back to the funder and say, hey, there's some caveats to what I originally said and we like to make some minor justifications, not to the scope of work, but to our budget and how we actually use the money. So I really want to encourage you to use the kickoff as a partnership with our office to help you put your best foot forward in managing your grant. And how you start is literally how you finish. So we want to be able to support you in that kickoff to be ready to set up your, your grant budget accordingly and how you want to move smoothly through the process. Okay. Um, in that price pro, um, process, we also want to talk to you a little bit about indirect costs. Uh, indirect costs is a very big topic at the university. Some of the grants do not allow them. Some of the grants have a, a capacity limitation. So a lot of your training and education grants typically are capped anywhere from 10% to 8%. So the Department of Education, typically their training grants are 8% IDC. We'll talk about breakout of the IDC in a moment. Um, on most of our federal grants, we do have a, a permanent IDC. Well, it's, it's temporary until 20, 2015. It's three to five years, indirect cost rate from the federal government. It was approved by the Department of Health and Human Services, and we are at 39% at this time, okay? Uh, if we have some state grants, they may allow IDC, they may not allow IDC. What we've seen is typically it's anywhere from a maximum of 15%, minimum of 10%. 
So um, we'll work with you, Denise will work with you on that when you're submitting your applications. But when we go to set up the award, we'll explain that to you as well. One of the major things I want you to take away today from that indirect cost rate is if you are a first time faculty member applying for a grant, we would need you to work with your department to set up your indirect cost rate cost center. That cost center is separate and privileged to you. If we don't have one set up, then we're not able to attach the IDC process so that you can get your um, component of the required IDC out of that. So we can talk more about that at the roundtables, but I just wanted to throw that out there so you could ask questions later. Okay. One of the next things I want to talk about quickly is the period of performance. That means the start and end date of your grant life cycle. Within that grant life, life cycle, there's an enumeration of different things that will happen. Let's say it's a three-year grant. Your period of performance is your full grant life cycle. Let's say there's a new grant that starts January 2024, and it's going to go all the way through Janu um, sorry, uh, January 2024, and it'll go all the way through December 31st of 2027. That is your period of performance. However, your annual budget comes through yearly. That is your current period of performance. So it's the life cycle and then it's your grant year, okay? We will work with you every year when you receive a new notice of grant um, award from your funder. And sometimes we have to set up a new cost center, sometimes we just extend the cost center. So we'll, when we have our workshops, we will walk through that information with you so that everyone is more clear about that process and they will understand, you all will understand expectations and will also understand your needs during the process as well. So overall, we do this because we wanna ensure grant compliance. That's one of the things that I'm really big about, regardless of what we do in our office, we are, all, we are very cognizant of grant compliance. So yes, sometimes we do miss deadlines and we apologize for that. There's a lot of you know, things going on behind the wizard's curtain, but we're putting in processes to strategize that, to make sure that we have a more efficient process and that you are aware of those deadlines in advance, as well as we being aware of those deadlines. Sometimes we get in our day-to-day -day actions and you know, you're moving through your priorities for the day and something happens and you have to stop and shift to something else. We wanna to move to a, a, a process of where we're all aware and we're gonna be more transparent so that we, be, we can become more compliant with all of the grant funds that we have, okay? So now I wanna talk a little bit about the indirect cost rate distribution. This is something new um, that we're sharing, the new split. It's not posted on our website, but if you have a current grant in the office, you're aware of this. So I believe as of December, we started the implementation of the indirect cost rate distribution. So the only change is between academic affairs and ORSP. Currently the department receives 15%, the PI receives 20%, and the college receives 15%. The initial 50% that ORSP was receiving is now split back the way it originally was to ORSP receiving 40% and the Academic Affairs Office receiving 10%. And you might ask why? Well, Academic Affairs, we're up under that tier, right? We receive a lot of support from that office. So we work closely with uh, financial affairs and other um, administrative staff in that office. We're very gracious to have them as well, as well as the work that we do um, with the provost, Dr. Bordelon. And the Office of Research and um, Sponsored Programs, we receive 40%. And if you didn't know, that those funds is attributed to our salary and the work that we do to manage the office. So it's not additional funds for us to do or buy equipment. It's actually to manage and supply support for our office. So we're grateful for that. And we're appreciative of you as a PI being able to understand and allow us to use that IDC as well in the work that we do. Next. Uh, period of performance. I'm not going to um, go through this, as I mentioned. Uh, we can talk about this at the roundtables, but when you do receive the presentation, all of everything in blue is live link. So it'll go directly to, and we've checked the links, they'll go directly to the current portion on the website where you can find that information. When it does change in the future, we will make sure that everyone has an updated list of where you can find our policies and procedures, as well as any other information per imperative to our department. Okay. 
Uh, points of consideration. We can go through uh, this a uh, little later, but actually Denise spoke up on this earlier. So this is just um, repetitive information in regards to the things that you need to consider in regards to writing your proposal and then the management of the expenditures in our office thereafter. So as a PI, understand that the Office of Sponsored Programs mm -hmm. essentially is your safeguard between you and your agency. So you, we want to make sure that you're always compliant with everything that's happening because there is a standard of rules that never changes that comes down from the federal government and most institutions <laughs> and agencies, whether they're federal or not, adhere to most of these guidelines. And every institution and entity has its own set so a part of what we do is to ensure that we are always great. We're always wonderful, everything is perfect, everything is great, we wanna keep you out of an orange jumpsuit. So this is why the Office of Sponsored Programs is always important at every institution because there's a lot of information that um, most PIs and most faculties don't have time to go through and read. We almost have it in the back of our head about rules and regulations that never change. So a, part, a huge part of what we do is to ensure that we're always compliant. So a big part of our pre-award and post-award um, services is to ensure that we are always compliant with any, rule, any rules from any of the funding agencies. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about some exciting things. Let's talk about the actual funding. I wanna highlight the work that you've done over the past few years significantly. Um, can you go to the next slide for me? Sorry. So I want to show this slide. You've probably seen this before in a couple of other um, sessions that you had, spe specifically strategic planning. But I'm really excited about this slide because it shows the actual growth that we've had in trending from 2021 20, to 2023. And that number is highly increased now because since that time, I think this was captured for end of August, we've significantly increased our awards. We're continually getting in award notifications. So I wanna give a big, get big hand clap to each of you in here because you work very hard on putting together strong proposals. And we don't take that lightly. We know the work that you have to do um, specializing in your wheelhouse contributes to this. And it's not easy to put together a, put together a quality uh, proposal. And we, we know it's very competitive. So the fact that UHD is growing in our research capacity and bringing in new grant awards, it's phenomenal. We are not at the stage where we're considered a research institution. That's okay. But we know that the work that you do is graduating into our increased external funding and we want to work with you to improve upon that. So go back to that previous slide. Um, thank you. So one of the significant things that I wanna talk about is on average, we are bringing in $10 million in revenue and ex external expenditures, but we are managing total right now an average of $26 million in sponsored research expenditures. And that means from the life cycle of all the grants, some of them are five years, four years, three years, you know, some of them go beyond, have come in before that 2021 time period. So that those external funding dollars contribute to that large number. We have increased 50% in research funding in 2023. We have to report um, restricted research expenditures annually to the state. We have to report it to uh, the UHS system. And Denise will be working with you um, closely to help strengthen your proposals and to help elevate those numbers as well. So a large part of what our office also does is training and in informational sessions. So coming up through the spring semester, we're going to host a few workshops and we will send out information on each of these sessions. The first one is going to be becoming a principal investigator. And that's for mainly new investigators, but if you wanna join as a current investigator to learn any new trends that have happened and we'll, as we'll have guests that are coming in to kind of discuss some of their experiences, it's always a good opportunity to get best practices from um, those individuals. Our fellows are also going to host workshops as well, and these are gonna be more peer led where we'll do roundtable discussions with other faculty members to kind of discuss the process and things that you may encounter in your proposals uh, development. And that will be including the road to proposal, which is essentially how to even begin the process and why is it important? And then the writing and review to kind of discuss what happens 
when I get funded or I don't get funded and I get feedback, mm -hmm. what do I even do at that point? So um, those are some things that faculty members don't necessarily always tend to go back to. They see the bad review or they see the criticism and they just leave it at that. Always take it, take and adhere to any feedback that you receive from a funder because it just may be what it takes for you to improve on your proposal that you'd already uh, submitted before. We also plan on meeting with the departments to kind of introduce ourselves again and to learn who you are as faculty members and what your research strengths are and what goals you may have going forward as far as your research endeavors. Um, we also host bi-monthly yeah. lunch and learns. So we have the bi-monthly <laughs> lunch and learns and that's both for faculty and staff. And we started this in the, the summertime. So some of you are aware of them, but we're kicking them back off again this month. So there will be a faculty bi-monthly um, bi lunch and learn that will be that date will be to be determined. We're gonna space it out you know, from the retreat. So we're gonna give you a little bit break. So it'll probably be, probably be towards the end of the month. We also provide one for staff so that we can work with your support staff who are working with you on the grants to make sure that they're updated on our processes and procedures and also to hear from them the challenges that they're having in managing and working with you on their grants because we want to head those off early. So it's a partnership again. So we're trying to do these workshops and meetings with you so that we can support you, be a, a great support to you. And we want to hear feedback from you as well. So we look forward to seeing you at these workshops and these Lunch and Learns coming up soon. So thank you for our time, your, your time today. We appreciate, we know that this is your retreat and it's your time. And we just wanted to make sure that we inserted a little bit of time for us to share with you about the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. And again, Denise and I are, are, are we have open doors. So we look forward to you meeting with you. And as some of you know, you pop in and we try to service you as best we can. And we look forward to continually working with you throughout this new year. Thank you. Thank you.